Imagine traveling to the top of a large building and from the top dropping a ball. We can model the height of the ball at any given time by a function. If the building is say 100 meters tall, then the height at time t will give, be given by a function 100 minus approximately 5 t squared. In particular, this means like at one second, the ball is at 100 minus 5, 1 squared, which is 100 minus 5, or 95 meters. Again, you can look at two seconds, you'd be at 80 meters, and so on and so forth. We can also then begin to ask questions about the velocity of the ball. In particular, how quickly is the ball traveling? What is its instantaneous velocity at exactly one second? What is the instantaneous velocity of the ball? at time equals one second. Now, you'll recall that when we say instantaneous velocity, it doesn't make sense if you think about the way Zeno did, where you say freeze time at a one second and, and take a snapshot of what's going on, and well, the ball is not traveling, so its instantaneous velocity must be zero. That can't be right. Instead, what we do is we come at this problem by doing a limit of its average velocity over shorter and shorter durations of time. That is, you might begin by saying, if we want to know what's going on at one second, let's focus on some period of time, say the average velocity from one second to 1.5 seconds. We can calculate that. That would just be, well, let's find it. It's, it's the height at time 1.5, minus the height of time one, all over the difference between 1.5 and one, which is 0 0.5. And we can calculate this out. At 1.5, we're at 1.5 squared, 2.25 times five, 11.25, subtract from 100, that's 88.75, minus a time one, we're at 95, all over 0.5, subtract this, divide by a half, that's times by two, you get 12.5, negative, negative 12.5 meters per second. What does that negative mean? Well, the ball is falling, so its velocity is downward, so the negative is cueing us into the fact that the ball is moving in the downward direction. But again, this is the average velocity from 1 to 1 1.5, so it's not quite telling us what's going on at time 1. Let's zoom in even closer. Now we can look at the average velocity from 1 to 1.1. Very similar, it would just be f of 1.1 minus f of 1 all over 0 0.1, the difference between these. Plug in 1.1, you get 1.1 squared is 1.21 times it by 5, 6.05, subtract from 100, 90. 3.95, f of 1 is 95, all over 0 0.1. So that's going to give you 1.05 divided by 0.1, or times 10. That's going to give you minus 10.5 meters per second. Okay, we can keep doing this with shorter and shorter durations, but let's go ahead and now think about this as a limit. If we want to know what the instantaneous velocity is, the instantaneous velocity, we should think about that as the limit of, of doing smaller and smaller periods. So, so instead of being at 1.5 or 1.1 or 1.01, we can keep making it smaller. We're gonna do one plus just a tiny infinitesimal amount. I'll call that H. One plus a tiny amount. So H is a little number. It's a number that's going to zero. We're taking the limit as H goes to zero then minus f of one, just like before, all over the difference between these, which is just h. What does this limit come out to be? Well, let's plug in and find out. My one plus h, when I plug it in, I get 100 minus five times one plus h squared, minus f of one, which is 95, all over h and I'm taking the limit of this as h goes to zero. Okay, let's expand this out. One plus h squared is going to be one squared, or one, plus 
2h plus h squared, then when you times that by minus 5. So that will then give you minus 5, a minus 10h, and a minus 5h squared. When I then begin simplifying, I have 100 minus 5 minus 95, those cancel. So I'm left with just minus 10h on top, minus 5h squared, all over my h. The limit of minus 10h minus 5h squared all over h as h goes to 0. But of course, you can further simplify this. This h on bottom, you can pull out one of the h's on top, then cancel that h you pulled out with the h on bottom, leaving you with just the limit as h goes to 0 of minus 10 minus 5h squared. Letting h go to 0, that whole 5h squared piece is going to go to 0. That whole piece will go to 0, leaving you with just minus 10 meters per second. That is, we see as we shrink the interval of time, we can figure out the instantaneous velocity as the limit of this rate of change. It's the limit of the rate of change, which comes out to be minus 10 meters per second. There's also a graphical way that we can tell the story. Let's look at this function, 100 minus 5t squared, and we can go ahead and we can graph it. And so this will look, it's a parabola pointing downwards, minus, minus the 5t squared, gives you a parabola pointing down, something, something like this, a downward pointing parabola. At one, I'm up here at 95, and, and we've seen that when you're a little bit more than one, say like when you're over here at 1.5, you're further over, you're at the height 88.75, you're at this height 88.75. Now, now, what does this value here represent? Well, it's the change in the y values, my function values, divided by the change in these t values, or my, my, my x coordinate, right? That is just my slope, that's my rise over my run. It's how much my height is changing over how much I'm running. So that is just the slope of the line that connects those two points. So this represents a slope. In particular, since this is a line connecting two points, we call this a secant line. This is giving you the slope of this secant line. So it's a slope of a secant line. This one's also giving you a slope of a secant line, but now instead of it going from 1 to 1 1.5, you're going from 1 to right here at 1.1. So the second point would be somewhere over here, so it's the slope of this line. Then what's going on in this limit? The limit is the slope of the line you get when you move this second point closer and closer to 1. We moved it from 1.h, 1.5, to 1.1, to 1.01, to closer and closer and closer as my h is going to zero. What would be the result of moving it closer and closer and closer and letting that h go to zero? As the second point moves closer and closer to the first point, you end up with lines that approach this special line that just touches in at this one point. We call this the tangent line the tangent line. And so here, the, the limit gives you the slope of the tangent line. This tangent line would have slope minus 10. Its slope is minus 10, because the tangent line is the result of the limit of moving the secant line with the second point closer and closer and closer to the first, until in the, in the limit, it has just a single point there. Here we've seen a couple different concepts, but they're all equally the same thing. One is the idea of instantaneous velocity. And we saw instantaneous velocity, to figure out what that is, you need to find the limit of this rate of change, the limit of the average velocity. But that then came out to be the same thing as the slope of the tangent line. And so since this value has so many different meanings, we can give it a special name. We're gonna call this the derivative. That is this value we just calculated here, this would be the derivative of our function at one. 